Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And I'm Jenna. And this is your So Guys a Phenomenon that was Miami Vice. You heard right. Jenna is back, and that means you know exactly what episode this is. This is Season 2, Episode 11, titled Phil the Shill. Jenna had to be back for Phil Collins. Couldn't stay away. It originally premiered on December 13th, 1985. It was written by Paul Diamond, who also wrote the episode Evan. If only he could have channeled some of that magic on this episode. (laughs) 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 It was directed by John Nicolella. So he's back again, the showrunner and director of many episodes in season two. This is uh, one of many that he will have left in season two. So we will see him many, many more times this season before he takes off and gives up the lead for Dick Wolf. Before we get started, let's check in and see who's going to each other's lives. And guys, I will start off this time. And I will say, uh, if you are hearing this, you've already, you're already aware of our change in the schedule. We're just changing. We're pushing the schedule for Go With The Heat back one day. So instead of coming out on Thursdays, you're going to see it hit your feed on Fridays. And the reason why we're doing that is because we're going to move This Week in Vice, the compliment, the complimentary show that goes with the, with Go, Go With The Heat. They'll come out on Wednesdays. So it's sure up to date with what was happening when Miami Vice was on the airwaves in 1985, or pretty soon 1986, before the main episode comes out. So, little change in schedule. Uh, the main episodes for Go With The Heat will be coming out on a Friday, as you know now, because it's just hit your feet on a Friday. And This Week in Vice will be coming out on Wednesdays. So, and other than that, I'm sure we don't have anything else to talk about, especially not a certain rat that is trying to break out of his cage right now inside of our home. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Charlie the rat at it again. <laughs> Causing trouble. For having alternative types of pets. <laughs> you guys hey. with the classics, man. Dogs and cats. Hey, we saved that rat, okay? We took him into our house. We opened our home to him, and this is how he treats us. He tries to eat his that way out. Me, that reminds me of a Christmas ad I saw one time. Someone said, like, a uh, found injured rat on corner of, like, Pike and 12th. Wasn't cooperative. I'm holding it. If, you, if you're if you missing your rat, please contact me. And I'm thinking, so this dude just found a rat in an alley that was injured. I took it home, and he thinks it's someone's pet. Yeah, exactly. It it's sounds like it's his pet. pet now. Yeah, it's his pet now, yeah. Speaking of dirty rats, let's go over and talk about the rat that is Phil Collins in this episode. Let's go over and talk about, let's give our breakdown on this episode. So this opening was very different than the normal Miami Vice opening. There's lots of questions that are left to be answered before we get to the end of this very short open. Can I just say, this opening left me very confused. Normally, uh, when a show opens, it gives you an idea of the rest of the episode to come. The mystery you're going to, or the journey you're going to embark on. This Mm -hmm. opening doesn't tell you anything about anything. It's just confusing. You have what appears to be almost a Japanese game show. (laughs) And you have Crockett getting his butt kicked for no apparent reason. And it opened. And, you know, it's like there's not even a crime committed, like, (laughs) except, I guess, by the Vice Squad. But, I mean, I'm just, I was so confused. What do those things have to do with each other? I don't know. And that's on top of that. The the game show has nothing to do with the main storyline. We never actually meet the real bad guy throughout the whole episode. We don't really know anything about him other than he tries to sell small amounts of cocaine through like uh uh his lover slash street dealer uh Sarah out you know going to yuppie parties. But otherwise, we don't learn anything about Rivers and Phil. We don't find out. So so a little bit of background here. We open up with a game show. It's called Rat Race. Phil Collins is get, is hosting the game show. Switek is on the show as a contestant, as as himself, as Stan Switek, the undercover policeman who's on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. can, can someone just explain how they thought calling in sick so that they can go be on a game show is like is a reasonable thing to do i'm assuming then that this show only airs at like midnight on some random channel or something <laughs> that it's not like a prime time thing yeah and the fact that and they yet both somehow the entire vice squad is <laughs> right. watching yeah i know 
<laughs> just you just see Switek. He's on there. The undercover cop is on TV. There's someone With his in the real background. Name. <laughs> yeah, there's someone in the background dressed yeah. like a mouse. The contestant that's there is always one of our guest stars in Emo Phillips. That's all you see in this. You don't see anything else. They finish the game show bit after the opening credits. We never get a answer as to why Phil Collins or Phil, I forget what his last name is in this episode, Mayhew. Yeah, May- Mayhew. Phil Mayhew is hosting this show. You never find out how he got that job. Yeah, exactly. He's supposed to be a two-bit con man, and yet he has a job, a legitimate job as a game show host. <laughs> and he doesn't. And the game show makes no sense. You yeah, the run end is maze so weird. And answer questions <laughs> about Elvis. <laughs> How come he didn't have to wear some like crazy mouse or rat getup? Like the other, the girls in the background that are holding the the, the styrofoam cheese, they're dressed like rats. So how come she doesn't have to? He's a perfectly functional, practical rat tail going. Like he could easily have yeah. done that. Can we talk about Vice Jesus in the crowd with with the, his best polyester white suit? Um, I know his suits are so bad. It's like, what are you doing? And why did he have a, he had his Jesus face on this week, but last week he didn't. Yeah, he, he was, was clean shaven. Exactly. Like, miracle yeah. he could grow that thing in a week. Like, how did he do that? So he's a, He really he's is part Jesus. of the Corvo family. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one last thing about this crazy game show. Um, Phil Collins has a fabulous skullet going. <laughs> you know, the mullet with the bowl that, with being bald at the front. And he's got the widow's peak. And the widow's peak is almost like aimed at you. It's like centered in his head. <laughs> That's an arrow pointing at you. He's yeah. the next airbender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's so many questions about this game show. It's called Rat Race because it has like seven A's in the race for the title. No, no, no. It's like seven R's. It's Rat Race. (laughs) (laughs) But then also like we know Switek is an Elvis junkie and he wanted to be on this game show bad because they answer questions about Elvis. How was this show on the air? Like you said, John. (laughs) No, no. I don't think they answer. Every episode is not about Elvis. This just happens to be that episode was about Elvis. Because mm-hmm. I said like, the twist he, the knife because he doesn't get the question and it's yeah, exactly. an Elvis question. Yeah, that, that's what they, they say in the show. He says in the show, Phil says like, and this episode or this this game, we're, we're answering questions about Elvis. But I don't think that's always what they do. I think that's just the trivia. Yeah, well, it just worked out that regard- way. Yes. Yes. Regardless, Switek, the Elvis fan, loses. Even though he feels like he, he, he got stolen. But I mean, you could just see... You know, he loses, he's crushed. Now, he's never going to move out of his mom's basement now. <laughs> yeah, and Zito's like, this is it. This is your last chance. You'll never get that chance back. He's like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jamaican Tubbs and Crockett are on the sting that G- that G- Vice Jesus and Switek were supposed to be on, but they called in sick together. Their whole job here at the Big Splash, just whatever this bar or restaurant is, <laughs> Is that Crockett is going to get into a fight with, I'm just going to call him Muscles Rocco because we never learn his name throughout the whole episode. So I'm just going to refer to him as Muscles Rocco because that's what he makes me think of. He said, get in a fight with him. That way Tubbs can get into his car and plant a wire. And Crockett, for the most part, he holds his own in the beginning. But then Rocco decides to start beating on him like a gorilla. Yeah. And the fight (laughs) ends pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And Tubbs is terrible. Uh. Crockett gets his butt kicked, and all I'm thinking, like, watching this is, like, so, wait a minute, Crockett just attacked the dude, so that's, like, assault one, and Tubbs mm-hmm. is stashing a tracker, which, you know, they're, or listening device or something, but God knows they're probably doing it illegally, and this mm-hmm. is about right for the Vice Squad. <laughs> <laughs> After Tubbs successfully puts the wire in and Crockett gets his face stomped on we go to the opening credits when we come back from the opening credits we see that brief scene where they see Switek on tv and they mission and we'd hear before the credits that Switek and zeta were supposed to be doing this but they had called in sick and so Croc is there nursing his face they see Switek on tv we head back over to the rat race and this is what you guys were talking about is that they go through this weird obstacle course and then whoever gets to it first gets to answer a question about elvis and 
I want to give Zwitek credit here. He does make it there first, but I think it's because he's cheating. Because you see a bunch of times where he totally skips sections of the <laughs> obstacle course. <laughs> he made his own obstacle course. <laughs> Clearly, the director or whoever was on set telling Zwitek on how to get through the, ob- the fake obstacle course did not prep him well enough to know that you are supposed to go over the mousetrap and then through the cheese maze and up down the slide. He just skipped that over the mousetrap part. It's like Double Dare or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there is some controversy here. Switek thinks he got there first. Emo, but it ends up being that Phil says Emo got there first. He asked him a question. Emo gives a very clearly memorized, specific detailed, answer. specific <laughs> answer. The fix is in mm-hmm. and Switek is on to it. He is pissed. He confronts Phil at the end of the show and... Phil says, hey, this is the last show. The show's been canceled. We're not making this show anymore, so you can't come back on next week. You had no con- consolation prize. And that's the end of Zwitek's one and only shot, as Vice <laughs> Jesus puts it. <laughs> <laughs> Relief from rat race and head over to the abandoned, to an abandoned warehouse. Over at this warehouse, it's, it's in the evenings, this, car not a limo just like a nice car comes pulling up a suit and a woman get out of it there's two people strung up by their feet swinging over the car through the warehouse muscles rocco gets out of the car the suits yells some stuff at the people who are swinging and then rocco shoots and kills them and they leave the next morning the cops show so, up so that scene just made me think you know says you can't make murph fun you know turn it into a carnival game <laughs> Swing them from the ceiling see yeah, if you exactly. can hit them you know they, so, they look like they were the, enjoying the other thing it made me think too if only they had put a tracker in their car so they could have found them <laughs> before they killed these people they could have caught them in the act the cops do say the next morning when they find the bodies they they tell the duo who show up there too that Someone saw Rivers Mercedes at the scene. They have some cooperation between with the wire that was inside of the car. So they do, it does use it to some extent, but the only thing it gets them is a new warrant essentially to be able to go search them some more. Hey, they weren't trying to save lives, okay? They were just trying to drug, <laughs> drug bust them. <laughs> In case that hangar, that abandoned hangar wasn't familiar, it was also uh, part of Evan. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's in the Evan episode, too. Yeah, Yeah, where they're right there shooting the guns and all that. Yep. So do you think that's the writer who just wanted to use the same scene? Or was Budget Vice like, hey, remember that stuff you wrote in Evan? Can we use those same set pieces that you wrote in those ones? (laughs) I think I know, because it's also in two more episodes in seasons four and five. So (laughs) Budget. (laughs) Along with that house. It's it's already set up. It's still set up from last time. Let's just keep using it. It was also featured in the film Bad Boys. It's really, it's just been an effective uh, warehouse. They they got a deal on it. You see, they uh, <laughs> they paid one month's rent. And they got three months for free. So, <laughs> <laughs> knowing that Michael Bay directed Bad Boys, that's probably the last thing that Hanger was ever in. Done Michael Bay probably blew that shit up, <laughs> or he just ruined oh, yeah. it in general. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the notes, yeah, the notes that I the notes that I have say the Hanger also appears prominently in the 1995 film Bad Boys, where it is the location of the climactic shootout, and then. And in parentheses, it says, and in which it is obliterated by an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a nice condo building there. <laughs> <laughs> After we leave this hangar, we head over to the precinct, and Zwitek is talking to Zito. He's very angry. He's like practicing his speech that he's going to give to the game show and why he's got, you know, you're going to hear from his lawyers. And Castillo comes walking up. And this is just a quick scene. He tells them, Castillo tells the B team, you're relieving Gina and Trudy on the graveyard shift, and you're working double shifts, and you're being docked a day's pay. So Castillo is not messing around with these guys. And no, Melissa, it is clearly against department pussy to lose at game shows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Melissa, I think you had a question about why are the ladies always working graveyard? 
I'm like, why, why are they punishing him by, them by making them work? Them making them work graveyard. That's a punishment for because the guys, but the girls hookers. have to. Yeah, that's what that's what Dominic said. Yeah, so the girls always <laughs> have to work that one, but it's a punishment for the guys because they're always hookers. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hookers work? I mean, during I the guess day? they could be hookers at ten o'clock in the morning, but I mean, <laughs> I would imagine their job would be much slower. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you don't, you definitely don't make as much money, but you know, <laughs> they're needed, right? I mean, there's people that work the graveyard that, that want to get rush. hookers. Yeah, exactly. There's gonna be people that work the graveyard that want to get hookers in the morning when they're done with their job, right? You drive a bus all day, all night long, and then stop and get a hooker on the way home. <laughs> I think they're missing an opportunity is what I'm saying. They could be, they could you really know. corner the market on that yeah, exactly. looker shift. <laughs> <laughs> Mid-morning shift, you know. So next we head over to, I guess it's a hotel. Maybe it's Emo Phillips' place. And Phil and Emo are splitting the money. Emo definitely has some sort of mental <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so phil is splitting up the money it's 80 20 emo gets 20 phil gets 80 and then we get this fantastic bill collins shopping montage it is what fantastic is the shopping montage <laughs> even for like does it does it help us at all like it doesn't have anything to do with the plot like i just don't get the the shopping montage. it shows you like, that he has no idea kill. He has no idea how to handle money. He's got eighty thousand dollars, and he goes and buy the car. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I want to like. I kind of need some advice from from Phil on this one because he puts eighty thousand dollars. He gets a car. He buys like a whole new wardrobe. He buys a crap load of jewelry at some jewelry He's got that store. House? Like. <laughs> What? Way more than 80 grand. Yeah. Where's this money coming from? And he has money left over, too, because later on in the episode, he pulls out, he gets into a safe and starts pulling out money. What is he doing? <laughs> Renting this stuff? Is that what's going on? He rented that car, maybe? One is clear. He knows how to make a, he knows how to get a bargain. He gets the Lamborghini. He gets that jewelry. He buys some musical equipment, which is why I thought at first he was laundering the money. He was buying expensive things because he's going to go sell them again for more money. But no, he's just keeping it. And he buys, he meets Sarah at the jewelry store and he buys her jewelry too. So really, how far does $80,000 go? Maybe in, in the 80s. Uh, maybe in the 80s it went a lot further. Maybe we just Wait, don't know that. <laughs> does he buy a telescope while he's out? Yes, he does. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell is he going to do with that? <laughs> Okay, I thought I was seeing things. So, no, he, he does. Yeah. I have a question. The Lamborghini buys, it's a white Lamborghini. Is that the same Lamborghini that from a few episodes ago, the Gina episode? Yeah, it looked like it. <laughs> oh, good question. So did they did they have a retainer on that? Like, we got to use this Lamborghini. Like, we have a $15,000 retainer on this car. Use it up. They do yeah, that. that's what I thought. I was like, oh, he's clearly driving the same Lamborghini as like four episodes ago. <laughs> yeah, they do that. They keep, yeah, they bring it back. I'm sure they filmed them at the same time or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just one payment at a time until it's Crockett's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually like Phil Collins' Lamborghini and they in like they just yeah, keep borrowing true. it from him. That's true. <laughs> Come on, Phil, let us just film with it one more time. We'll let you drive it. <laughs> well, and that's what happens when we leave from the jewelry store. So Phil's being introduced to Sarah. They go for a drive. Phil goes to drop her off at River's yacht. And we get some great lines here, too, in the writing where Phil says to her, you're looking at a man with a nasty habit. And then Sarah says, Phil, <laughs> this is the 80s. Everyone does drugs. And then Phil says, no, I just like to buy things for women and I can't stop myself. Yeah, he's really laying it on really thick. <laughs> really, really thick. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, by the way, Sarah is Kira Sedgwick, who, she's the closer. I mean, that's all you need to know. She was the closer. <laughs> that TV show on TV, on TNT was on, for like, God, it must have been on for about nine or ten years. Oh, yeah, she's also married to Kevin Bacon and was in Ally McBeal and a bunch of movies and stuff. But she's the closer. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we're talking about another show that John watches that none of us know what the hell he's talking about. I don't yeah, know what John, that is. I think we're breaking into your FX habit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know what that is. TNT. Oh, sorry. TNT. <laughs> yeah. The closer even spun off into another show. Like, there's... <laughs> He's, like, shocked that we don't know it. I'll offend you. Sit back down, John. It's okay. Sit back down. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We see across the water that the beat team and duo are watching the river's boat to see Sarah come up. And Switek is on to that he knows that Phil, somehow he knows that Phil dropped Sarah off. So Switek's starting to get his hope up, hopes up that this bus is also going to bring down Phil. We also see in the, com in, uh, Crockett mentions 
Uh, I think it was Crockett mentions that there's another man on the boat. His name's Tim Stewart. He's a pilot that Crockett busted back in '81. That guy will will be will make an appearance very briefly in the very <laughs> short, in the very near future. Yes, it's a brief one. Yes. <laughs> and Crockett's still pretty salty about the whole Switek calling in sick thing and getting his face punched in. So there, they, he's still not on speaking terms with Switek. There's a little bit of tension there. <laughs> <laughs> now we go over to Phil's deal of a house that he bought still with this leftover $80,000, <laughs> apparently. And I have a question yes. about what he's doing right when we come in, because he's standing in this empty home and he's just staring out the windows. Like as if he was like they were doing an episode of Miami Vice and filming one of his music videos at the same time. Maybe it was a bargain. Maybe they were using that house. <laughs> <laughs> the doorbell rings. That house is so 80s and like with the pastels. That, like it, It's almost like it was decorated to look like Pee Wee Herman's playhouse. <laughs> I, would, I would believe that that mansion is the great McCarthy mansion. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think like, they, it's the same house they use. They've used that house so many times right. for like mm-hmm. parties and stuff that they go to. The doorbell rings. Phil goes and answers it, and at the other end of the door is Izzy. <laughs> Izzy. <laughs> Izzy holds up of his course. wallet, yells, "Is is Dor Moreno, designer of the interior? Sorry, I only got the one." And then pulls his wallet up and puts it back <laughs> in his pocket. <laughs> and you know, it's like he he wrote it on his car, his own card. It's like a piece of paper. He wrote his name and like a number, not even like printed out. I do want to point out we're getting a lot of Izzy this season, but we're not getting a lot of Nuggy. Um, bad news. Bad John. news on the Nug man. Uh, he ain't coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh no he nope. makes one more appearance <laughs> and it's all because him and don johnson got onto a fight on set at the beginning of season two and then the nook man was he just disappeared uh because yeah it, no he, because of his drug use that's what it like that's what i read is it because of his drug use mm-hmm. him and don johnson didn't get along and mm-hmm. they had, like a huge fight and don johnson like said basically kicked him off the show like i won't do i won't work with him so yeah, he won't make another wow. appearance. He'll make one more appearance on the run of the show, and it's like in season four. Yeah, and it's like a really weird circumstance that he comes back in. Sad news. Wow. You don't get no more Nook Man. But good news, we get lots of Izzy between oh, now Izzy and then. Izzy goes all the way to the end of the show, you guys. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> okay, all the way getting, to the end. I was getting ready to take so my headset off the- and walk out. I was. I uh, was sad. <laughs> Well, Izzy's here at Phil's house, and he's going to help him do interior decorating and also <laughs> put him in connections with people. For people, I don't know, the conversation just kind of kind of wanders around where Izzy says he has the right connections, and Phil just shakes his head, and that's the end of that conversation. And then What, Izzy- what is very <laughs> curious about that scene is that, uh, or, or I guess what I kind of liked about that scene is that Izzy's clearly a con man. He's a two-bit con man. We've grown to love him because of that. And then you have Phil Collins, who's also playing a con man. And it was funny to see the two in the scene, almost like they were trying to con each other so much that they just went along with it. Like, Phil should be really questioning why this guy showed up out of the blue. And Izzy hasn't sold anything to Phil yet, you know, but they're both just kind of going along with it. Like, this is... Cool. And it's very much that Phil didn't call an interior designer. Izzy just came and knocked on the door. <laughs> and then he worked his way in to go ahead and decorate Phil's house. Yeah. And so when Izzy walks out, waiting for him out outside the front door down near the street is Tubbs and Crockett. And they are not happy to see Izzy that he's there. And Izzy says, hey, it's not my fault. I didn't need backup on this. So I tech put me up to it. And now... Crockett is really pissed at Switek, and that's where we go over to the bug ban, and Crockett's going to lay in the Switek. What was yeah, the goal? Switek's clearly, <laughs> like, clearly trying to get fired now. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> right. Sorry, I'm, I'm laughing at Tubbs calling him a chump, so I'm already ahead. <laughs> <laughs> in my head, I'm already like, he call him a chump. <laughs> Crockett's yelling at Switek, saying, this is a year and a half of police work on the line, and Tubbs says, quote, you could have left it alone, chump. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite's what's coming from the back seat out of Izzy Moreno. He's suggesting ways that they could spy on <laughs> the microphone that looks like um, a cloud. Underwater, su- <laughs> underwater surveillance, shotgun mics attached to the neighbor's house. That look like clouds, um, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yes. They essentially decide that they're going to keep Izzy on the inside. He he can get them into inside of Phil. The, that might come in handy because he knows Sarah. So they're going to leave him in. But Zwitek is hanging by a thread here. He's taking this so personal game show, so personal. He's willing to do anything just to bring down Phil. We leave from the bug van and we go over to the precinct and Gina's just giving the rundown on the rap sheet for Phil. Lots, he's a, he's a two bit thief, con man, no history of violence or drugs. Uh, they don't know why Phil wants, what he wants with Sarah. What they decide to do is that they're going to use Izzy to introduce Cooper and Burnett. So Tubbs and Crockett to Phil and then use Phil to meet with Sarah and then use Sarah to go meet with Rivers. Cause that's not complicated at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> we go back over to Phil's new house and Phil's out swimming in the pool. Like Izzy said he was going to be doing that he's English. So he's going to spend all of his time in the pool. Then we go <laughs> the first scene we get with Phil back. He's in the pool <laughs> so. <laughs> with some kick ass goggles. Let me tell you what. <laughs> and some really short shorts, by the way. Those were some like practically speedos. <laughs> with his hair pressed down like that, it looks almost normal. So. <laughs> <laughs> Izzy calls Phil in to see his final design, which credit to Izzy, man. He can con his way in and he always delivers. So he calls Phil in. How is that delivering? Hubcaps on the <laughs> wall. The hubcaps on he the wall to stay classy. Fish. He puts up like a he puts up like a, a freaking marlin and a bunch of hubcaps and buys some neon furniture and suddenly it's like the best design ever. Well, I think there's one prop inside of the house that stands out the most, John. There's an old tiny bike upstairs <laughs> on, on, along the balcony. Like a unicycle. And I immediately almost. wanted the mustache man to ride it. <laughs> John, <laughs> writing down his notes, mustache man, riding old tiny bike. <laughs> I was, Phil needs to I get was himself really a hoping that's where it was going. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, it's an old tiny bike. Like, where's He's... the muscly dude with the mustache? <laughs> <laughs> muscly riding it. Phil's what, already what? got the little shorts that he can wear. It's going to be perfect. <laughs> There's some great dialogue in this scene, too. Izzy's showing around the camera, pans all across the room, show how great his design, hubcaps and everything. He goes over to this neon giant, like, armchair rocking chair. And Phil comes over and sa he says that his grandma had a chair just like it. <laughs> His grandma had a neon rocking chair in England? Like, come on. <laughs> I don't think so. And then Phil gets out of business. He says, how do I meet this Cooper and Burnett? And Izzy says, you throw a party. You throw a party, you'll get, quote, more yuppies than you can shake a booty at. <laughs> <laughs> even weirder because of the doorbell rings and it's Sarah and she stays for lunch while Manny and Izzy cater and DJ the lunch <laughs> at <DJ>. the house. <laughs> what is going on? What is Izzy's role? He just randomly came and knocked on Phil's door. Now he designed his he, he designed his interior as Izzy would put it and then he cooked them lunch. He's waiting on them at their table and then he has his then he has Manny DJ servant. <laughs> <laughs> This Dude, Izzy, Izzy is so that crackhead that's always got a deal going, always got something for sale. He's like, it, mm -hmm. always got an in, always got like a business plan going. Yeah, he's always got, he's always got something going on and, and multiple things, right? It's, I'm not just all in on this one thing. I have seven things all in the fire right now. Sarah and Phil take a walk down to the beach and this is where it gets a little serious and a little creepy. I don't like Phil <laughs> at this part. Oh no, he's creepy. <laughs> yeah. Sarah asks him for money. And then Phil implies that he can give her the money and that they've already had the drugs and the rock and roll. And that only leaves one thing left. Yeah. And then he just creepily <laughs> stares at Sarah. Why, but a, Phil? <laughs> but Why? it's a good thing that Izzy breaks it up, though, right? I mean, <laughs> we don't have to be subjected to it. <laughs> I just feel that Padme sums this up the best when I'm looking at Phil in this scene. Like, You're going down a path I cannot follow. <laughs> You're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> we leave from Phil's house. We go to a driving scene. It's nighttime now. The duo, Tubbs and Crockett, they're following rivers. And the tail, it turns from a tail into a chase really fast. And Melissa, you were talking during the episode that Crockett is no good at secretly following people. Okay, how can you secretly follow someone when you're in a convertible? <laughs> 
<laughs> first of all, he's, I mean, his car is not, it's a car that's going to stand out, right? First of all, it's like a sports it's car. A it, yeah, it's a Ferrari, okay? And then you have them dressed in their, their nice suits, and he's wearing the same outfit as when he fought with the curly haired muscle man. So, how do they not know who he is? Exactly. In what? the same car. In, in the, the same, same car, car that he accused yes. him of hitting. Yeah, exactly. So how are you? They're like the worst because they are in, always in their regular cars. And also, Tubbs' car is a, is a convertible too. And it's I even mean, how it's, it's, Melissa with all the logic. How don't does, you know it's eighteen months down the drain? <laughs> eighteen months. Like they said that like six hundred times. I think it might be eighteen months. Yes. I'm not quite sure though. But yeah, okay. Well, in the eighteen are you months, sure it was eighteen. Why didn't they learn how to follow people in the eighteen months? <laughs> Get a different car, people, okay? It's clearly not working. You never can just get lost. Ferrari's been behind me for like the last 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would imagine that it follows the same logic that Crockett slash Burnett does not trigger any similarities to the people that he meets. And also, why is he using the same last name? Like yeah. He doesn't all this time? even put on like a fake mustache or something. <laughs> like he's not even trying. <laughs> he wears the he same didn't have time pants. to plan anything. It's only been 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, they lose Rivers, and then they overhear on the wire that Muscles Rocco had found the wire in the car. <laughs> they trash it, but then Muscles says that the only person that's had access to the car has been that pilot, Tim Stewart. Remember him? We <laughs> mentioned Tim. his name. Or whatever his name is. Yeah, it's Stewart's fault. Let's go kill Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, well, he Dude, and I feel bad. I feel so bad for Stuart because they kept rolling up, and the guy like lands his helicopter. He's like, I, "Hey guys!" And then they just shoot him. It's like, <laughs> like, man, that sucks to be Stuart. You know, like didn't even let him out of the helicopter. <laughs> How long do you think that helicopter kept going before someone found a dead body? <laughs> Because they killed Tim, that renews the warrant. And they and so Castillo says we're gonna go put a wire on Rivers' boat because they're able to. Someone because- shut off this helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> go back, come on, we have to. <laughs> so then we go over to Rivers, and the ladies are gonna go do this. They're undercover. I don't know what they're there for. Are they catering? Yeah, his- they're like catering, and so they're just delivering food to him. So they they plant a so wire funny. inside of the boat. We also see that. Rivers asks Sarah if he should go to the party with her, and she says, no, this is just business. I'm going to go alone. I'm going to go make some sales, and then I'll come back later. You can see Rivers is a little put off by what's happening here, but she goes alone after the wire, and then we also see that the wire was successfully installed on the Rivers' boat. So now we go back to, it's the next day, or later that day, and we go over to Phil's place, and he's having the yuppie party. He's having the yuppie (laughs) party you can shake a booty at. (laughs) And there was no booty shaking. I saw no booty shaking going on. And that suit that Izzy Moreno's wearing, is that peach or salmon? (laughs) I don't know what's better. The shoulder pads in that suit or the fact that he's definitely wearing a pirate shirt underneath it. Yeah, he's he's got the pirate shirt on for sure, yeah. We really see, we get a taste for now what Phil's game is. He's telling everyone different stories one he's building condos in the bahamas another he has a, a racehorse hidden and all of them have a scant one hundred thousand dollar investment that's he needs to think of a different number because everyone he's make he's talking to he says that it's only for a 100 all you need to do is invest one hundred thousand dollars yeah that seems well, suspicious what he, what he was with what he was able to get with eighty thousand dollars man imagine what a hundred grand will get <laughs> <laughs> Sarah's out working this party. She gets, she's able to sell a whole key to the PTA and then she runs into Cooper and Burnett and they want to set up a big buy. It's weird that they've invested so much time. I think it was something like 18 months um, <laughs> into an investigation <laughs> for a drug p- kingpin that's barely selling one or two keys to like soccer moms and stuff. I mean, they're clearly not the type of criminal people you would expect to be buying weight. You know, it's like, I'm rich and I want to buy like a bunch of uh, uh of stuff for the Tupperware party. <laughs> I'm gonna have the bitchiness Tupperware party ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like I don't know if you guys have been to a Tupperware party, but it gets 
pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, let me, let me put it this way. These are the same people that actually, that, that get sold or, or oregano instead of pot. Yes, they are. I was fully expecting them to get, uh, to actually give them kilos of sweet and low from the sweet and low <laughs> hype episodes back. <laughs> <laughs> the artificial sweeteners back again. <laughs> so Sarah and the duo disappear to go set up their buy. Bill walks in on the PTA discussing how much everyone, how much money everyone needs to come up with to buy a whole key, and he says that thirty five thousand dollars, which is what they're going to pay to Sarah, is a ripoff. He'll sell them three keys for twenty five thousand a key, so they're going to save a whole bunch of money. But he's going to get seventy five thousand dollars, so we know that what Phil's going to do, he's going to take the money and then just disappear because he acts like he doesn't even know what he's selling. And then we go over to where the duo is making their deal with Sarah, and the leader of the PTA comes and tells her not to deal with, not they're not going to buy from her. They already talked to Phil. They know what the story is at twenty five thousand a key. And so now, not only did Phil cost money and not be able to sell it to the PTA, but now Cooper and Burnett, in Sarah's eyes, now know that there's a cheaper price available, so she has to come down on the five keys that she's going to sell to Cooper and Burnett. Yeah, so I mean, just if you've ever been in sales, the, you, you don't ever just. Cut the bottom out of your price. You know? <laughs> this, this is going to cause a whole bunch of trouble for good old Phil. Because Sarah goes from sweet little lady, she's maybe being pushed around by a drug dealer, to I'm going to go break Phil's fucking knees. Yeah, exactly. Get him in the car. I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get him, muscles. I'm going to drive him. Get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> they take him over to R- to River's yacht, and the the duo follows. So they follow them over there. They're watching from afar. I was so convinced Vice Squad was about to see a murder. Exactly, because Sarah is she's not supposed to be selling whole keys. She says she's bored with selling small amounts, but hey, there's great profit margin in small amounts. A little risky, able to build a rapport, but she's overstepping her boundaries. Rivers is very upset about that. Also upset that Phil's undercutting to bring Phil in. And this is when Zwitek drops it like, oh, this is when it gets good. Like, is is Stan hoping Phil gets murdered? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think so. Because <laughs> it often sounds an awful lot like Stan once failed to get murdered. That's a police officer hoping someone gets murdered. Yeah, you don't I ever mean, question about it. <laughs> don't ever question Stan's passion for answering Elvis <laughs> trivia. <laughs> on vice jesus okay because <laughs> he's got it all up in uh in switek's brain that this is the end of switek's whole life okay <laughs> and people do drastic things when it's the end of your whole life <laughs> rivers beats phil up a little bit and then says look you're gonna be my middleman we're gonna sell these eight keys uh so go back over to your house and close out these deals with cooper and burnett and then with the pta we go back over to Phil's place, and of course, Phil, he's going to go straight into pa- packing up. He's going to make a run for it. But the duo walks in on him, and they tell him, hey, tough shit. You're going to have to close out this deal. He's able to work maybe getting immunity for helping them, so he'll get off without without having any jail time from this. But he's definitely going to help them bring down bring down rivers within minutes or seconds after that conversation. And so the doorbell rings again, and on the other end is the PTA. And they show up, they're going to buy their three keys. Now, because it was one key, but now three keys at $25,000 each, which is some a lot so of money. I feel like we, we missed one little detail about when Phil comes back. Is he slow dancing with the blonde to no music? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that blonde is, is Phil's actual wife at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, Lily hmm. Collins' mom. When the doorbell rings, is Crockett reading a black and white comic book? so here's how this is going to go down phil calls rivers and says we're going to make this deal at this amusement park the pta comes in crockett and tubs play it like they're real serious crockett even pulls his gun out the pta realize in a very bad acting fashion that they're in over their head which mostly you were saying like they're buying three kilos of cocaine. How do they feel like they're in over their head? I don't understand. And they were like the weird, the strangest group of people to be together too, right? They all look like they would never. Like, how do mm-hmm. they really know each other? <laughs> and why are they actually? They like, all volunteer at an urban garden. Yeah, That's exactly. They know each other. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. They're all making beet smoothies in their zoodle somewhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking bean sprout. Yeah. Oh my god. I don't understand. 
understand what they thought they were getting though. They were buying that much. What are they going to do? They're not buying that drugs that much that amount of drugs just for personal use, right? They're going to sell it. I didn't know this was going to be that like this. Like, what do you think it was going to be like? You were going to go and it was going to be like a normal transaction. Like, you know, here I'm going to give you this check. Well, I mean, throughout the throughout the whole episode, they're so just calm about it, you know? Like, oh yeah, hey, just come over here. Let's go in this room and we're going to talk about buying drugs, folks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're like, well, this is probably yeah. They're acting like it's a regular transaction for something like they're gonna buy a, t- a crap load of Tupperware or something. Like, well, I really want to get that strainer that comes along with it, Dick, for bonus. <laughs> Phil tells them, "Here's the keys to my house. We're gonna be back in a half hour. Thanks for your money. I'm going with these two Tubbs and Crockett. We're gonna go buy them. We'll come back and we'll finish the deal here. Which, by the way, we never go back and find out what happens with the PTA. Are they?" <laughs> Still there. sitting there? <laughs> still sitting there. They're going to come back, guys, I swear. <laughs> so we head over to the Coral Amusement Park. This is where the final deal is going to go down, but not the final scene of the episode. We have one little scene, almost like a Marvel after credit scene to end this episode. But first at the Coral Amusement Park. River shows up. He's there with Muscles Rocco and a couple of his bodyguards and with Sarah. Switek is undercover. He's working the gate. Phil and the duo show up in their separate cars. And Rivers isn't happy that, as he knows them, Cooper and Burnett are there. But they decided to make the deal. Now, this is the biggest question for me. How was this ever a good idea on the Vice team on how this was this should have gone down? Throughout the amusement park, there are vice officers and regular police officers stationed hidden around the, the amusement park. When they hand Rivers the briefcase or hand it to Sarah, Sarah gives it to Rivers. Then when he opens up, it just catches on fire and flames shoot out of it. And then a shootout starts. Doesn't it seem an awful lot yeah. like it would have been better if they just would have all, if the police officers all would have popped up at the same time and said, you're under arrest. They just would have given up. Yeah, it's just, it, it's just a weird thing how they do it. And what, what bothers me is one, how does mustache, mustache guy not recognize Crockett or the Ferrari from earlier? <laughs> um, that, that bugs me. And then, yeah, so it's like, 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 they hand him a briefcase with smoke grenade in it. And then that, like, they were just going to run and, and, and like tackle him or something. Like, who comes up with these plans? I don't know. And with that, they, sh- so they shoot and kill everyone on the river's gang except for Sarah. She runs off and gets away. Phil gets in his Lamborghini. He gets away. The rest of the gang gets shot and killed, including Rivers, but a police officer gets shot too. Like, how was this a good idea? They, this could have been so much better coordinated instead of killing every one of the perps and a police officer being shot, which by the way, Crockett runs over, points at him and says, get this man some help and then runs, and then <laughs> runs off. I'm like, no crap, get him some help. <laughs> yeah, just leave him there. I never liked Steve anyway. Just leave him there. <laughs> and then the last thing we see in the bust is, Switek is still saying, like, okay, now let's go get Phil. And Cassio says, nope, case is closed. We got our man. R- Rivers was the person that we were going after. And Switek is very hurt about that. He thought for sure that this would be... Phil runs off with one of the bags of money. He runs off with like 75 grand, I think yeah, they say the at the end money. of the episode. <laughs> and the cops are like, ah, screw it. Let him go. <laughs> you know? We'll it's never just, find it, him. <laughs> it's PTAs out 75 grand. It's just no one cares where this con man went. No, and he's got multiple passports. Passports, as we saw when he tried to run away the first time he went into a safe he's got multiple passports ids and stuff like they should have wanted to bring him down too but they were just happy with shooting and killing rivers that everything's good but switek is not happy with that they weren't able to bring phil down and that's where we go to the last scene of the episode we're over at stan's place stan and larry are hanging out they're watching uh zito was trying to find something for them to watch on tv switek is out walking around the house he's saying how the world's such a degenerate place and zito just starts flipping through the channels and he flips onto a channel and you see phil he's a televangelist and he's giving sarah eyesight again on tv hearing i think it's hearing oh, i think it's she's hearing ear in one ear. ah hearing yeah <laughs> hearing the left ear <laughs> yeah. so stan yeah. grabs his gun and says this one's for you elvis and shoots his tv and then that's the end of the episode well that just uh-huh. made a whole load of sense <laughs> hey, well i mean zito is at the end saying what are you doing <laughs> not stopping him but just you know questioning it so apparently elvis shot a tv at some point and so it was supposed to be a reference to that 
He yeah. Shot the is that what that's Robert Robert Goulet? Is, yeah, he shot. Yeah, he got mad because he didn't he didn't like Robert Goulet and he shot. Which like, is what the the question was in the, the question rat was. race ending. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that at, was, least you know. we came, at least we came full circle. <laughs> yeah, it was the final. Well, that's the end of this episode. Let's get over and talk about the music, which was surprisingly lacking in film music. Let's go over and talk about this at this episode's music. All right, John, I know you're not going to lie to me, but I was really hoping that there was some top 10 Phil hits in this episode, and there is not. And not only that, but there's only one Phil song in the episode, and the other one is over the ending credits. So I'm hoping you have some better news for me in the music segment this week. <laughs> there is actually more of a Phil connection than you would think. You're going to, once I go through the section, you're going to find a theme here. We start off with the Phil Collins song, Life is a Rat Race. Originally, the song was called The Man with the Horn. It was recorded for Phil's second album, Hello, I Must Be Going, in 1980, though it Never appeared on the album. It actually appeared on the B side of Susudio in the mm. UK, and it appeared on the B side of One More Night in the US, both Genesis records. That song, The Man with the Horn, was rewritten for this Vice episode and retitled Life is a Rat Race. It was never released in that version, even though it charted at number 38 at the time. It was never released as a single or in that version as Life of the Rat Race. And Collins has been, has said in interviews that he holds no emotional attachment to that song. Ouch. So that song was, <laughs> was basically a reworked version of another song that clearly Collins never really appreciated. Probably didn't even want to do, but... Why he had to make it fit for Vice, so that's how that mm. song got there. So, mm. and like I said, even though it charted at number thirty-eight at the time, thinking like, oh well, that's probably our only Phil Collins connection. So we continue on. The next song is "Pick It Up, Put It in Your Pocket" by Stan Ridgeway, which is just a terrible name of a song. <laughs> as a side note, Stan Ridgeway is an American multi-instrumentalist and singer-songwriter, <laughs> basically. He, he's a film and TV composer. He was the lead singer of a band called Wall of Voodoo way back in the late 70s, in the 70s. And then he tried to start a solo, he has started a solo career in 1983. Pretty much the only thing you'll ever know Stan Ridgeway by, unless you're like a huge jazz junkie, is for stuff that he's done for soundtracks. He's done songs for Francis Ford Coppola's Rumblefish, which was a Mickey Rourke, uh, Matt Dillon movie, and other films like that throughout the 80s and 90s. He's actually released eight total albums, but like I said, it's mostly just instrumental albums. So the next song get is Nausea by Executive Slacks. Sorry, you said Nausea. I was trying to make a joke, but apparently it wasn't funny. <laughs> oh, uh... <laughs> Yeah, we get the song Nausea by Executive <laughs> Slacks. So there's not a whole lot. It, it it took a little bit of Googling to find some stuff out about these guys. So apparently, basically, they were only a band from 1987 to 1990. They really go unnoticed, but people have kind of said that their music has... Ba basically, it pioneered the way for bands like Ministry and Nine Inch mm. Nails. Oh, weird. Yeah, exactly. Weird. So, but I can tell you that the, the band members met at Philadelphia College of Art, met Marcello, who is now a visual artist in uh, New York, was one of the founding members. Uh, another one, uh, the, uh, the other founding members, John Young and Albert Gans. Um, Sounds good I have to me. no idea what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you that Athon Morale Lewis, Morales, or however you pronounce his name, was a former vocalist of the band at one point in time. I can't confirm at what point. I can <laughs> confirm that he, that when they broke up in 1990, that was clearly the band against him. <laughs> because if you, uh, I, the few things I found with the names of the bands, his name is crossed out. <laughs> So, Ethan is, he now runs Sepation Records, a vintage vocal and jazz record label, 
and is also known for narrating and producing numerous like historic compilations, like mm. compilations of like Buddy Holly music and Miles Davis compilations, like that. You know, those. Uh, when I read it, my assumption is is that it's those like blues compilations that you see on those infomercials. You know, other than that, the executive slacks pretty much go unnoticed throughout history. There's not a whole lot about them. It, it was just one article that was say, claiming that they were some kind of pioneer. For like nine inch nails and stuff. That brings us to Rock by Day and Roll by Night, which is a Eugene Smith song. This is where we finally start to see our theme. This song is another song that was recorded exclusively for Vice and was mm. only ever released as a single. Eugene Smith was a gospel singer from Chicago who had a long career. Uh, for a long time, he sang with the with the Roberta Martin Singers. Until Roberta Martin died of cancer in 1969, Eugene Smith would sing gospel and perform other songs pretty much all the way until he died in 09 at the uh, age of 88. Eugene Smith's father had performed with such notable people as Duke Ellington and James Brown. And he performed with some notable people in B.B. King and Gordon Lightfoot. What an odd the, selection that they had him do a song explicitly for Vice, though. Yeah. So uh, outside of that, on a interesting side note, Eugene Smith briefly served in World War II, but was discharged b- for, because they considered him too short. He was barely <laughs> five feet tall. I didn't know you could get discharged for being too short. but I thought they had a whole Steve Rogers program that took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. So... And then we get to our last song, Knock on Wood by Eric Clapton. And Dominic, this is what I mean by there's more of a Collins connection than you realize. Okay, so, I'm ready I'm ready to see that Phil Collins connection in this episode between Slohan and Phil. I'm ready. Okay. Knock on Wood is an Eric Clapton song from the album Behind the Sun. Behind the Sun is is, is the nineteen eighty five album and Clapton's first compilate compilation project with Phil Collins, who co mm. produced it. And played uh, on some tracks. Okay, that makes sense. You need a good drummer. Yes. You go out and get the industry's best drummer ever. Take that rush. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. So, don't yes. at me, bro. Don't at me. You heard me. So in this episode, we have a song that the Vice tried to make Phil Collins rewrite for the show, which Phil Collins clearly does not like. <laughs> um, and then we have. Him playing drums for Eric Clapton. So a little more Collins than, than, than you probably thought. So obviously Eric Clapton, amazing guitarist. He's jazz, known blues, for Derek and rock. the Dominoes, jazz, yeah. blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The album Behind the Sun was pretty much about his trouble in his marriage with Patty Boyd, who he was married to at the time. And they say, like, actually, most of the songs are written about that. When they were recording this, Eric Clapton and Patty Boyd had separated. Being in 85, that they separated, they tried to get back together, but they would end up divorcing in 1989. Patty Boyd also being the ex-wife of former of Beatle George Harrison. Ah. Huh. Yeah. So, and it turns out, Boyd met Clapton because Clapton and Harrison were friends. <laughs> so, Eric Clapton totally macking on George Harrison's ex-wife after they broke up. <laughs> they say, so according to the article I read, that while Clapton was with Derek and the Dominoes, that the album Layla and other assorted love songs is primarily ri- written professing his love for Patty. In particular, uh. the song, the amazing song, Layla. Ah, uh, so there's, so, there's, a li- there's lots more to this story somewhere. Yes, a little bit about the song itself. Knock on Wood was originally an Eddie Floyd song written by Eddie Floyd and Steve uh, Steve Cropper, and it was covered by Eric Clapton on that CD. It was also covered only a year or so before by David Bowie. Oh. Yeah, so kind of weird. So there you go. There's your music. Two songs specifically written for the show. Two songs with Phil Collins pretty much connection. written by people you would never have ever have heard of and never will again. <laughs> and then Phil Collins jamming out on the drums with Eric Clapton. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go over and talk about our final thoughts on this episode because I think I think this is a forgettable episode, even though Phil Collins is is deeply intertwined music and acting. 
All right, Jenna, you're our guest. Why don't you kick off this week? What are your final thoughts on this, the fantastic Phil Collins episode? Well, I gotta say, I had high hopes. I really did, because <laughs> I love Phil, and I was here for the Phil. I would consider myself potentially a shill for Phil, and, uh, <laughs> and it, just, it, it just really struggled to deliver. I think I would much prefer him not speaking. <laughs> just, the only thing that was really, that was quality on this was, uh, was the Switex storyline, believe it or not, for me. He's just so freaking weird. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that was, it was interesting to me at least, and a little sad, but, you know, it's it, consistent enough that I can dip in and out on this with you guys, and it's, <laughs> I still have a, a pretty clear storyline of what's going on. Um, do wish for it more of those fashion montage segments that they do with the big spenders. I feel like that's become a bit of a hallmark here, and, uh... <laughs> And, and, and I'm here for it. If only we could get Phil in some lime green. He was in a lot of shiny shit today. And uh, <laughs> really, really hoping for the bright colors. <laughs> well, I would say that every episode that Izzy makes an appearance in, it's a good episode. Not is the whole thing good, but at least the Izzy parts are good. And that's kind of how this episode goes. Like, I was with you, Jenna. I had high hopes for this episode. But let's be realistic. Dale Collins is a Hall of Fame rock artist, not an actor. I think he did his best, but it's just not not up to vice quality here. And that's a <laughs> Pretty <laughs> That's a low. That's a pretty there. low bar. Like I was, I was kind of disappointed. The story's there. It's just, just the acting all around is bad between the PTA and Phil Collins and Rivers and Sarah. Like it's just, just wasn't as good. And as hearing that the writer was the same writer from Evan, it felt like that there was a, that there was good opportunity here, but it just kind of didn't quite get there. I still had a lot of fun watching it. Izzy was great. The storyline of the rat race and how Phil says con man and con man versus con man with Izzy and Phil was still great. It was still a good story. Things just, I wish I would have gotten to know Rivers more. But I still, it's still a lot of fun. I still like laughing at a lot of this episode. So it's probably good for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I guess I, it's pretty much the same, the long lines as you guys, that it is funny and it's not serious at all. And Phil's acting is terrible, but there was no, <laughs> there was no real bad guy in this episode because you mm -hmm. didn't get to know the bad guy. Yeah, I get it. He's supposed to be terrible and ruthless. He killed that poor pilot <laughs> without <laughs> even blinking an eye. The man didn't even get to step foot out of his helicopter before he was shot. <laughs> but other than that, there, there was no real bad guy and you had no idea what he was really into either. There was no mm -hmm. – what did he do that was so terrible? Because there's so many other drug dealers that they could have spent 18 months following and all that time <laughs> and work they put into it. clearly selling one kilo at a time. Yeah. Know, exactly. just made them. So how did they even – how did he even appear on their radar if he was just doing it, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there? But, I mean, other than that, it was a good episode. Of course, Izzy. I love Izzy. So any episode that is Izzy heavy is good in my eyes. And I love the duo. So, and, you know, and the B team. I love them all. It was lacking the girls, though. Yes. There was no girls, really. No, no. Well, John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? 18 months, guys. <laughs> 18 months for this episode. You and we didn't even it. get a halfway decent Phil Collins song. <laughs> we didn't even get a Phil Collins song that made a Phil Collins record. Okay? <laughs> why didn't they make him a freaking musician? Like, why would that yeah, not that is true. I don't know why they go. didn't do that. <laughs> why, why do we not have a better Phil Collins song for the Phil Collins episode? I, just, I don't know. You would think this episode would be a prime candidate for another day in paradise. But no, here we are. <laughs> no paradise allowed in this episode. I mean, even if they had used In the Air Tonight or Sue Studio, you know, I would have been happier, you know. And, and just for me doing the music, only did they use a Phil Collins song that never made a Phil Collins record. They used an Eric Clapton song. Out of the few Eric Clapton songs that I don't know, like, why would you use this one? <laughs> just of all of the Eric Clapton songs, I don't know. I was 18 months, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> all that time down the drain. What a waste. That's going to do it for us Guess this Guess life week. is a rat race. <laughs> You mean rare race? Rare race. <laughs> As you can tell, we had a lot of fun with this episode. It may not have been the best episode, but we did have a lot of fun with it. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe. Check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Check out the website, goalwiththeheat.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. What are your thoughts on this Phil Collins episode? Are we a little too hard?
hard on Phil's acting ability here, we would love to hear from you. Email us goldenheat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Bye. Bye.